I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. This episode is brought to you by Castor and Pollux, maker of America's number one organic pet food, Organics. Look for their newest line, Pristine, the only complete line of pet food made with responsibly sourced ingredients. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org slash pets. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Welcome to The Line here on Heritage Radio. I'm your host, Eli Sussman, co-owner of Samis Restaurant in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I'm happy to say that in just a few days, it will be the one-year anniversary of Samisa, the Mediterranean spot I opened with my brother. And uh, it's been an amazing run. We've been learning an incredible amount of things, and I'm uh, ha- incredibly pleased with the staff that we have. And thank you so much to the customers. Uh, I'm really proud that, that we made it a year, but uh, compared to my guest today, I don't really know anything yet about the restaurant business. I, I suppose that it's unfair for anyone who really is opening a restaurant or owns a restaurant to try to compare themselves to Michael McCarty because in, in, in this industry, what he's done is nearly unthinkable. His restaurant in Santa Monica, California, Michael's, opened in 1979. The New York Michael's, which is in Manhattan, opened in 1989, and they are both still still very much open and thriving. Uh, Michael was uh, studying in Paris. He attended Cordon Bleu, and he has sort of been in the hospitality business for pretty much his entire life. I'm pleased to welcome to the show one of the creators of California Cuisine, Chef Michael McCarty. Thank you very much. So thanks so much for being here. I wanted to talk first about your childhood. Uh, You had mentioned that your parents actually met in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is cool. I'm a Michigan guy. And that uh, you uh, grew up, though, in sort of two places, right? You grew up in Briarcliff Manor, but also in Illinois as well. So tell me a little bit about your childhood. Well, my father uh, and my mother, when they got married right after the war, World War II, they moved to New York. He went to work for GE. And uh, they moved to a fantastic place called Briarcliff Manor, right on the Hudson. And it was sort of like this very bucolic, fantastic city right on the water and very close to New York. So we, I enjoyed this childhood with my parents who had an enormous amount of great friends and they were always having parties uh, in each season, spring, summer, fall, winter. And so it became this sort of fantastic life growing up in, in New York. And then years later, uh, when I went away to prep school, I went to France uh, as a junior in high school, and I got hit by the bug of, of France. So when I graduated, I went back to Paris, and that's where I enrolled in the Cordon Bleu, the, the Ecole Hotelière, which is where you would go if you were a French kid, and then the Great Académie du Vin, run by Stephen Spurrier. Don't know if you saw the movie Bottle Shock, but that's about him discovering California wines. So before we get into Paris, I want to talk about sort of some of your earliest memories of these wonderful ragers that your parents threw. So uh, I know that uh, you had this, there was something in Rhode Island, right? Right, There was a beach shack in Rhode Island. How did that come to be? You spent summer sort of at the shore. Yeah, I mean, it was very 50s and 60s mentality, very mad men. I mean, the the, uh, families moved to the summer house on Memorial Weekend, Memorial Day weekend, and they moved back on Labor Day weekend. And they would spend the entire summer there. And we had this sort of uh, rambunctious group, or my parents did, of friends. So there were about 22 homes there. And literally, they were beach shacks. They were dune houses on stilts. And they were cheek to jowl, but on this fantastic beach. And it's from there that I really began to see not only my, my mother and my father's ability to entertain fantastically, but also 
her devotion to products. For example, you know, we would go to the the Portuguese fisherman, and uh, in those days, you'd walk in in the back room, and he'd have a, a, a swordfish. But unlike today, the swordfish would be about two thousand pounds. And my mother would always get the choice center cuts, and and then she'd get the fantastic uh, oysters, and the steamer clams, and 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 the wife would grow the arugula and the basil. And this is in the fifties, remember? So there was no such thing as arugula and basil. Uh, you know, if you wanted spices in those days, you went to the spice rack. Mm-hmm. That's where they were, the herbs. So it was just this. Uh, my next door neighbor was from Kansas City. He owned the Kansas City Meatpacking Company. So he'd show up at, on Memorial Day weekend and he'd plug in his truck. And 90 days later, whatever was left, you know, was thrown for the Labor Day bash. So it was ingrained in us this fantastic uh, attention to detail in terms of foods and also people. It seems like there was no other direction for you to go in. You grew up eating incredibly well, and yeah. then you were uh, sort of – you were not subjected, but, I mean, you, right. were, you were present for all these adult-style parties where right. they really – they entertained everyone on the block, right? right. Yeah. Uh, why do you think your parents really were – so skilled at entertaining. Where does that come from? Well, I think my, it's just their natural, it was their natural uh, personalities. You know, my mother was uh, was a fantastic homemaker. She had four boys and my father. And, uh, you know, she really just ran the show. And my father, uh, they were very interested. Mind you, when we talk about the quality of the food and everything, everything was extremely simple. And that's one of the things that I've kept with me always from the beginning is the simplicity. There's no need to really go crazy on everything. It's just, again, the quality of the ingredient, and that is the one thing that stuck with me. Where we grew up, there were no restaurants. Uh, You know, Briarcliff Manor is a cute little town, but there are really no restaurants. But the night before I went to France, we ate in New York City, and my father and my mother and a friend of his, we went to a restaurant called Laurent, which was a classical French restaurant in the style of Maxime's. It was in the style of Le Pavillon. They were the classic French restaurants, you know, the beveled mirrored glass with the modern and classic sort of, what would you call it, continental French. That was really what was going on that Henri Soule started Pierre Freyny when they were at Le Pavillon, uh, which ironically is on 55th and 5th. Uh, actually, the restaurant I bought was the Italian Pavilion from the 1939 World's Fair. These four guys stayed over. They didn't go home. Um, but we ate in Laurent, and it was sort of, that was sort of the epiphany for me because at the end of the meal, first of all, I watched the owner walk in. It was September. The f- place was fantastic. Everybody looked like a million bucks. And the owner walked in, and the crowd went, it was like a dimmer. They went, wheat. And, and uh, then my father and his, uh, and his associate, they sort of argued over the bill. So it like went like this. It was like, wow, here's a party like at my parents' house. And then you give everybody a bill at the end of the night. I guess that's what a restaurant is. And did you know prior to that meal, did you know as a 10 or a 12-year-old, did you say this is the – career for me. This is the path. I'm going to go to France and study. No. Like, how did that come to be? Well, that, that my parents, living with my parents for 15 years, you know, was the, 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 the seasonal aspect of in the springtime in Briarcliff, in the summer in, in Rhode Island, and in the fall in Briarcliff, and then in the winter in Vermont, where again, it opens up these whole sort of regional things going on, albeit on a very small scale at the time, it was still very, very evident. Mm -hmm. Um, The next day I got on the boat that took us to France and it was called the SS Aurelia. And and most people don't know the history of this, but it was in fact a student boat and it took 11 days to get to France. And that may sound weird today, but it was absolutely fantastic because we were 50 little 15, 16 year olds and the other 1,450 were junior in college. And it was run by Italians. So unbeknown to me, not even really understanding the French situation yet, we had 11 days of five meals a day run by the craziest Italian waiters you've ever seen. And so it was getting the Dolce Vita at the same time without really realizing it. And, and it was just like, whoa, people live this way. You know, they, they have a, a breakfast, they have a snack in the mid-morning, they have a lunch, they have an afternoon, they have a dinner, then they have a late-night dinner. And... And it was fantastic. 
So you're gaining access to all these different cuisines and, you know, you go to a, a wonderful fine dining restaurant to yeah. kind of kick off your path to Paris, but you're only 15 years old. Right. And you're by yourself. Right. Uh, were you scared? Wh where did you end up when you got off the boat? Well, when what, I got what did that entail? Yeah, it was fantastic. Well, we were all placed in families. I happened to be, again, remarkably lucky. I was put into a French family. It was an old aristocratic family that had lost all their money. But, uh, you know, she was the uh, directress of a, ca a Catholic school for wayward girls. They still had their 900-year-old chateau, albeit all the beds were on wheels because when it rained, the roof leaked, so you just rolled your bed over one way or the other. But again, it was a... It was a, it, Brittany in Brittany, it was in Rennes, is a very folklore. So it not only did you have all of the French holidays and events, you had all the Breton, which are even wilder, you know. And so, and it, they were a huge family. And so there was always a reason for a celebration. And uh, I just sort of walked right into that, glided in and just said, yes, this is a whole nother thing, you know. So they had a little beach house. And I remind you again, these were not rich people. These were people that lived their life a certain way. You know, they would go to the the, uh, the old chateau that, that didn't have a bathroom until the 70s or 80s. Um, and yet there was a sharecropper who did vegetables. There was one who did the pork. There was one who did the, the fruit. There was one who did all the poultry. The, the beach house was an hour away at Quibron, uh, which is where Bailon, where the Bailon oysters come from. So it was like between the seafood of Brittany and the products growing there. And again, Brittany in the days, this is why I keep sort of reiterating this. It's a very, it was a poor province. Everybody had to be very creative with what they had. There was no like, well, I'll just buy that or I'll buy that. No, no, no. You had to either grow it or you had to think about it. It really set the tone. And it's from that family that I, because they had relatives in Paris, that I learned about the hotel and restaurant school, which of course we didn't have here in the United States. So when did you go into the Ecole? The, 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 the Ecole, the first half of the 70s. So I came back because my mother said, you've got to get your high school degree. So mm -hmm. I came back and got my degree. Um, I, I, I then went back to, to, to Europe just to check it out with my brother. We went the summer of 71, and uh, we went to Amsterdam for three days and stayed three months, and it was fantastic. <laughs> so again, it was really a beautiful moment in time. Uh, I came back, I went to see my brother in Colorado, and I decided to stay there for that, for that year, that freshman year. And then I said, you know what, I, I see this is, you know, the American way of going to the university, but I really want to go back to France. So that's when I enrolled at the Ecole Hôtelière and the Cordon Bleu, and, the, and then subsequently found the Académie du Vin. So how old were you when you returned back to so Paris that, to study for that second time and things were getting more 19, serious? 19. So it was, uh, again, a fan, and a fantastic time to be in Paris. So the programs there were like three years, uh, two and a half years at the Cardone. And, uh, and, and then it, well, life was very simple because, you know, I was very fortunate by living in Paris at the time. And going, the École Hôtelière taught you the method of Escoffier. It was a very classic form, and I'm very glad. It's like the Latin of the French cooking world. However, at the exact same time, uh, you know, starting in the late 60s, early 70s, was the beginning of Nouvelle Cuisine. So there was a revolution afoot. And in Paris, you had Michel Gerard, um, and you had, uh, just outside, you had the Trois Gros brothers, you had Bocuse, you had Freddy Girardet, you know, and this is all in the early 70s when they were just feeling their way of a revolution. So for the listeners, just kind of juxtapose that. Escoffier is mother sauces and, and classic French technique. Uh, yeah. And what were the new, what was the new guard doing that was a deviation from that original yeah. skill set? Well, the, to simplify it, up until the Nouvelle Cuisine Revolution, the goal was similar to the Olympics. If you were a chef in Berlin or London or Paris or Chicago, whatever, your goal was to duplicate the recipe exactly as it said in the book. What Escoffier did, he and Cesar Ritz, they opened up the Ritz and he, he codified French cooking, which means he wrote it all down. These are all the sauces. These are all the ways you can cook the, everything these are the and each dish had its name and each dish then was defined and that's what you as a chef uh, aspired to do if i'm going to cook the beef wellington i'm not going to get fancy with it i'm going to cook it exactly as it says in the book and you were graded 
and awarded your your stars and your fame based on your ability to duplicate it. Well, Michel Gerard and the Frere Trois Gros and the 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 um, and La Pyramide. Uh, they said, no, man, we're going to go nuts. And so they, they, they started to really just, you know, like we have seen, our generation or your generation has seen the, the molecular, what was called the molecular gastronomy. It was, again, it was just a, a couple of very intelligent people saying, oh, wow, we're going to go this way. We're going to try something different. Um, and, and, and so it was just the beginning of we don't have to do that anymore. And the, the second part of that revolution, because as you know, with all revolutions, they inevitably go too far. And Nouvelle Cuisine almost became a laughing stock. You know what I mean? Like the single scallop in the middle of a 16-inch plate with a glance of herb, a leaf on it. And that was it. What happened was, the second part, and almost the most important part, is, is that all of these chefs, after they'd had their way with Nouvelle Cuisine, and this was later on in the mid-'80s, is when they started to get regional. And, and I really believe America started that. I mean, I, I think we believed that we, the focus, and you used the term California cuisine, that's what we were labeled in California. You know, Alice Waters, Jeremiah Tower, Mark Miller in San Francisco, myself, um, down in L.A. We, we started this, what's out the window here? You know, what's supposed to grow here? And that regional American, that became known as regional American food, and that's what exploded throughout um, the United States, and then the world. you got to remember something. You know, Italian food, until the mid-'80s, was you had northern Italian food with the white sauce, or you had southern Italian food with the red sauce. I mean, Chinese food, Asian food, same thing. I mean, it was all sort of, uh, you look back at it, and it was almost like, what? How is that possible? And I think America, really, the chefs here, I remember 1983, I threw a dinner in San Francisco for the American Institute of Wine and Food, and I had to scrape together regional American chefs, and it was really difficult to come up with 12 that were actually not doing Italian food or French food, or they were doing American regional food. And that was a fantastic dinner. With some, with some amount of originality of their own, right? Oh, regional yes. food with some amount of originality. Oh, yeah. So when you're 19 and you're in Paris and you're seeing sort of the traditional and also uh, an avenue that's sort of departing from the traditional. Right. Was there a path that you specifically, Lane, that you found yourself in? And also, how serious were you at that point when you were cooking? Were you, was this a passion, but you weren't sure? Or oh, were you locked in? Oh, no, I was in. Okay. I was deep in there. <laughs> you know, people always ask, well, while you're in Paris, did you stage in any kitchens? Did you work? I, I, I worked one night at Le Serre for Rene himself. And I walked in, and in those days, remember something, 1972, 73, 74, it was just beginning, I mean, the regiment uh, of, of how you were trained and how you grew through the system was very archaic still. You know, I mean, 20% of the, 30% of the staff were free. They were from the hotel schools. They were doing stages all the time. And it was run like a military. You know, you're talking about, I was the oldest one in the Ecole Atelier. They were all 15 and 16, and I was a couple years older. But it was a, a path you chose after basically ninth grade. You decided, you know, I'm going to go for a baccalaureate, or I'm going to go into the trade schools, of which there are many in France. Um, and I realized after one night of, eat, of, 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 of standing in that kitchen and observing it with my eyes and my background, I said, this is not for me. I need to just go and eat in all these restaurants <laughs> and I will learn more in one night and one meal in a restaurant than I will working here because if, if I came back in six months, I'd be still doing the same thing in that restaurant kitchen. Because they're going to be keeping you in the corner of shelling beans or something that's exactly, like that? That's mm -hmm. exactly how they did because they were, again, it was very military because you were teaching. You were the father as well as the chef. You know, you were the general. You were the military sergeant. You know, you, you know, your job was to... People gave you their kids. And, you know, your job was to grow them Craft up. Craft them into a yeah. respectable human being. Yeah. <laughs> Did you speak uh, French at that time? Well, yes. That's the reason why I was very fortunate. Because having that gone must to, have helped significantly. <laughs> completely. Having gone to, to France in Brittany... Uh, as a junior in high school, you know, I was, you become fluent in the language, you know, your brain is still very fresh when you're 16. And, um, and so I was very lucky that I, I they wouldn't have accepted me in the Ecole Hotelier at the time. And at the Cordon Bleu, there was just five of us, three of which were Japanese. It was the beginning of the word fusion. I don't know if other people really know this, but the people that were enamored with Nouvelle Cuisine in particular 
were the Japanese. And so I had three Japanese students who, again, did not speak French, barely English. So half my job was translation and, and, and as well as learning what we were getting, uh, especially in the Cordon Bleu. And it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a, uh, just a fantastic time. How did your parents and your family back in on the East Coast in the United States react to uh, the fact that you'd chosen sort of a culinary career? Was at that point in time in France, I imagine it's a very respectable profession. You're going down this this route where you're going to Le Cordon Bleu, and right. in the United States, what was the general perception of someone who was pursuing such a career? Well, by that time, my parents had moved to Illinois. They were living in Rockford, Illinois, which was a fantastic town again, completely weird, but every single family in there uh, were these really... Uh, how would you call it? Very original, very entrepreneurial families. It was the Midwest, but they, were, they all owned their own companies. And they all were very similar to my parents in that respect. It was very fortunate. It could have been any other town or a big town like Chicago or something, but it was a very close-knit. And again, they entertained all the time. So when I came back, I was very fortunate that there was a, 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 a nice chef named Julia Child who was on the cover of Time magazine. So I sort of came back to the States uh, with this, and she was on TV, and it was like sort of like, whoa, a chef, an American as a chef, and not just a woman in the case of, of Julia Child, but that, what is this all about? So it was a very inquisitive time. People would say, well, so you really want to be a chef? I said, well, I really want to be in the restaurant business, and I, I realized in France that you have to know how to be a really great chef, or the old cliche is a chef walks out on a Saturday night, you know, in those days. Uh, probably still today, but, um, and so it was difficult because, you know, my brother became a lawyer. My other brother became a financial planner. My other brother was a banker. You know what I mean? I was the chef. I want to talk about a little bit about early mentors and people that really impacted you. Uh, I want to know who Fernand Point is. Yeah, Fernand and, Point. And, and, uh, and it, are there other people that, uh, either in the United States or in France that, impacted you in a dramatic way when you were extremely young before yeah. you opened up your restaurants. Yeah, I, I would say that Fernand Point is probably... Apologies to him for my poor yeah. pronunciation. Yeah, Fernand Point. <laughs> uh, well, he owned the great La Pyramide, and Fernand is probably a standout for me because he was a restaurateur who was not a chef. He, uh, yet he, again, ran the show and had his, no, no pun intended, his finger in everything. You know, he, he really ran, the, he designed the, the food in the, in, from, the, from the menu. He did the wine. He ran like a, like a perfect place. And that probably was the, you know, was the uh, 3D carbon printout of exactly what I wanted, which was he worked the room. Yet he was always in the kitchen in the morning and the afternoon. And I think that Fernand really set the tone. And it was very modern, too, remember. You know, he knew when to temper Nouvelle Cuisine. And he was in a region, you know, Vienne is, is, is in a, a suburb way down outside of Lyon. You know what I mean? It's not in a big city. And so he was the beginning of pioneering his local ingredients. He was one of the pioneers of, of, of regional French food before it was hip. Um, and, and so Fernand probably ranks right up in there. And when I came back from France uh, the first time around, uh, I, I spent the summer in Rockford, Illinois, and I worked for a guy named Tony Salamoni. And Tony ran a classic mob restaurant in Love's Park, Illinois. And I, I say that because he was probably one of the best-run restaurants still to this day that I've ever worked in or run myself even. And again, he was the front-of-the-house guy. He understood the kitchen. He trained the chefs. He told them exactly what he wanted on the menu. His wait staff were fantastic. And if you could imagine this time, you know, in, in the Midwest in the 70s, they had beehive hairdos, and they were making four or $500 a night in tips. So it was a very busy restaurant. Uh, um, and, and again, I learned operations from him. Uh, I learned inspiration from Fernand Point, but I learned the operation aspect, even though it was, you know, 1971, or no, what am I talking about? It was 69 when I'd come back from France, the first go around, and it was like, whoa, 
you know, you, you've got to be a business person. I learned that at the Ecole Hotelier, too. That was the one difference between just going to a cooking school, because there they teach you a third front of the house, a third back of the house chefing, and a third business. In terms of front of house and back of house, just building off what you were just talking about, did you ever consider when you were in Paris that you would not be a chef and that you would find a chef and be someone who would just own and operate a restaurant? Or did you feel that you always wanted to both be the chef and own the restaurant? Yeah, I always felt it was part and parcel, uh, you know, because again, unlike Fernand Poin and many of the chefs in the, 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 the owners in, in Paris, they had a system set up that supplied you with staff. We, we didn't have that in the United States. So when I opened my Michaels in 1979, there was no a pool of qualified individuals to, you know, well, let's call up, you know, the CIA and, and any number of thousands of restaurant schools today and say, oh, can you send me 10 guys and 10 girls? Can you just get them over here? There was none of that. So I learned very early on, uh, you know, at age 25 when I built the restaurant, uh, that it was going to have to be like a school and that we were going to be able to, to just be able, everyone needed to train as I always say, you learn from the person on your right and you teach the person on your left, no matter where you are in the line. And it was a very, and the amount of chefs that have come out of my kitchen is a testament to the fact that the system worked in that there was a, you, you always, uh, you know, you always promoted from within. It always went that way. And let's just take a minute to just briefly name a couple of the folks that have come out of the kitchen in Michael's Chef Jonathan Waxman, Barbudo and Jam, Sang Yoon, Father's Office and Look Sean, Mark Peel who opened Campanile and La Brea Breakery with at that time his wife Nancy Silverton who was also my pastry who chef. was also your pastry <laughs> chef who went on to now run sort of the Moza Corner Empire in yeah. Los Angeles and honestly we could go on and on. But uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about how you came back to the United States, how you launched Michael's, and also talk a little bit about Boulder, Colorado. Oh, yeah. We'll be right back. <laughs> Stick with us here on The Line on Heritage Radio. This episode is brought to you by Castor and Pollux, maker of America's number one organic pet food, Organics. You put a lot of care and thought into what you eat. After all, you're a food radio listener. That thoughtfulness goes hand in paw with how you feed your pets. Purposeful pet food doesn't happen by accident. Castor and Pollux scours the earth to carefully select the best organic and responsibly sourced ingredients. New Pristine from Castor and Pollux is the only complete line of pet food made with ingredients that are responsibly raised, caught, or grown. Feed your dog or cat the new standard, like grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish, and vegetables grown without synthetic fertilizers or chemical pesticides. Pristine from Castor and Pollux. Purposeful pet food. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org slash pets. Welcome back to The Line. My guest today is chef and restaurateur Michael McCarty, who owns and operates Michael's in Santa Monica and New York. Michael's in Santa Monica has been open for 37 years, and the New York location has been open since 1989. Michael, we were talking about you being in Paris and all the studying that you did, and then you returned to the United States. So right. where did you end up when you came back from your intense years of studying? And uh, and what was sort of the first project that you jumped into in the United States? Well, before I, I made my way west, I had applied to the um, summer program at Cornell School of Hospitality. Uh, I had found out about this uh, program. It's basically 90 days uh, during the summer. And you take one week classes, so it's the same class all week. And incredible time is beautiful there in the summertime, and the teachers I had were fantastic. Uh, for example, there was a guy named Vance Christensen who was a, a hospitality instructor, but at the same time he was completely enamored with California wines. 
as well as the New York wines, which are just becoming. So I went there for that summer and basically it Americanized you, whether it was business and tax law in the United States or it was butchering and how the Americans cut their meat differently than the, the French do. And it was a very, very informative, uh, uh, very informative summer. It was really great. And then I went back out to Colorado to see my brother, uh, and, um, and, and I sort of got shanghaied in, in Boulder, uh, the head of the French department and the head of the experimental studies department. Uh, my brother also went to the program in France that we went to as a junior. So he spoke fluent French and they were always infatuated with the fact that my brother and I could speak French with each other. Like we were French people, you know, they, they never saw us read or write, but we could speak it. And, um, so they, they came with me and we hatched this idea of saying, well, you know, I have these French students at the university that can read and write perfectly French, but they have a very difficult time speaking it. So I hatched the idea of doing French cooking in French classes. So in other words, you would, um, every week, there'd be nine of us and we would go out and we would shop and we would buy the food and we would buy the wine. Fortunately, there was one of the greatest wine stores in the United States of America of in all places of Boulder, Colorado called the Liquor Mart, uh, which is actually where I met the guy who sold the wine to me there. You know, I'd go in there and in those days, it's great. You say, I have $20, I need five wines. This is what I'm cooking. Can you match me the stuff? And uh, you could do that in those days. But also Boulder was an incredible uh, uh, growing region out there, you know, um, and everything that we found, we had a wild asparagus by the roadside. You had uh, chuckers, which are like a partridge, which were growing there. You had a trout from the area, you know, all kinds of great stuff that was happening. And so I could say that even in a place like Boulder, Colorado, in those days, it was beginning to rock. I mean, in the wine store sort of put it together. So that's how I sort of, I, I, I catered. I also started, uh, I was, uh, was uh, being a consultant for two restaurants in Boulder. Uh, and I was begin to learning the American sort of way. And, and it was a very intriguing time. I also learned, uh, you know, and I met people that were really into the restaurant business. There was a chef there named John. And he had a restaurant called John's. And he, if you could believe this, he was a pioneer of the prefix only. Hmm. You would go there and he cooked whatever he wanted. And you never dared say, oh, can I have it without this or, you know, or I'm this or that or that or that or allergic. No, 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 no. You either eat what he does or forget it. So, I, you know, I learned a lot more about that. And then that's uh, at the end of that in December of 75 is when I moved to see my parents in Malibu. That's where they had then moved in the early 70s. That's and, how I got to L.A. And so Malibu, Santa Monica at that time a little bit like the wild, wild west. There weren't many people living on that side. Yeah. And uh, I, I read that you decided to kind of open up in Santa Monica because you wanted to be adjacent to Malibu and you didn't want to have to drive to work. Exactly. I made a very de <laughs> determined decision that living in Malibu was where I was going to be. And I had a, uh, uh, there was a very good, well, my partner in my duck farm was a guy named Jean Bertrand who owned the great restaurant L'Hermitage. That was the best French restaurant in uh, the rest in Los Angeles. And it was in the restaurant district. And the restaurant district in those days was La Cienega. Uh, so it was Beverly Hills, La Cienega, which is now West Hollywood area. That area was the center of all restaurants, whether it was Chasen's or Perino's or the old guard like uh, Scandia. Uh, Le Restaurant Saint-Germain, you know, that was it. And I said, you know, driving back and forth to deal with the duck thing, I'm, I'm not doing this every day. So I constantly searched for a restaurant space that had a huge outdoor area because I noticed there were not many outdoor areas and this was California. And I ended up after about 18 months, 24 months, finding the Santa Monica location, which, by the way, was Tumbleweed Central out there. It's just so hard to believe that there was a time in which Santa Monica wasn't super desirable for every restaurant it's, and person to live. And yeah. that, I mean, you know, you tell anyone Malibu and it honestly, it evokes sort of unattainable luxury, yeah, right? But yeah. but at that time, was it really, it was really off, it was actually off the beaten path, Santa Monica? Oh, yeah. The, 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 the change of everything occurred in, in 79, ironically, not just with me opening the restaurant, but with, it was the, 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 the change of the motion of the city uh, had a lot to do with the fall of the Shah of Iran in a funny way. There was a huge influx of, uh, of, of Persians that came in and changed the way things happened. Uh, 
if you bought your house, if you had your house in Beverly Hills for 250,000, now it was worth a million too. Hmm. You know, everything changed and that was sort of the beginning of it. They also brought in uh, very educated people that had lived all over the world. So they would come into the restaurant and they would be like, whoa, like these are my people from Paris. You know, here they are. Somehow mm -hmm. they're here now. Uh, and it was fantastic. And, and at the same time, it was a generational switch from old Hollywood to new Hollywood. And I was very fortunate that my restaurant, Michael's, which opened in 79, um, the new Hollywood, which today is old Hollywood, but in those days, 38 years ago, it was, you know, the David Geffens and the, and the Steven Spielbergs and the uh, Michael Eisners and the Katzenbergs. And it was a very small group of young people in their 30s in those days uh, that um, were going to be different than old Hollywood. They were going to go out. So we were open seven days and nights and we were packed the whole time because of this generation. It was just a, a remarkable time. Who did you open uh, Michael's with? What was who was on the opening staff with you, and how much time did you spend uh, working the dining room and and interacting with guests, which now you become pretty right. famous for? And right. how much time did you have to spend in the kitchen, really putting plates in the past? Well, as I said before, I realized it had to be more of an educational facility. It had to be more of a collaborative effort. I realized in the first week that it was me, my responsibility to go out to the tables and special them because they'd never heard of a diver's scallop. They'd never heard of a, a raw diver's scallop served with French olive oil and a puree of heirloom beets. This is in 1979. They'd never seen that or heard about it. and they had. To... So I realized that it was extremely important to be out there. And I did the specials at every single table. During the morning and the afternoon is when I worked with the chefs, and and I had an extremely fantastic opening crew. We had Jonathan Waxman, uh, Ken Frank that owns La Toque in Napa, um, uh, Mark Peel, um, and uh, Billy Flug who worked in, in uh, uh, from Boston was a fantastic. He became the soup dude, uh, unbelievable. Um, and 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 then it started to grow. You know, Nancy Silverton. You know, she came to start as a as a computer. The, 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 the point of sale person at night because we used a cashier system very much like in France because I wanted my waiters out on the floor not in the kitchen punching in stuff um, and Jimmy Brinkley was my opening pastry chef and he was fantastic you know and I spent for example to give you an idea of what we did was I Americanized a lot I said how do you cook food for 150 people a night not 50 because that's what it was in the other restaurants and I said so I had to redesign all of the food everything that I wanted to do and it, it included the pastries. For example, we would take the classic, fantastic pinch pastries that I learned, and we would take out the sugar and the density and the booze, and we'd, we'd, we'd Californiaize them, you know, and it became that way with everything. Greens, greens, greens. And so talk about Californiaizing things. Uh, the Santa Monica Farmer's Market, right. very close to yes. your restaurant. Yes, Uh Coincidence, or did you we were look for search for a location? Did the market oh, come after your restaurant? It, how, yeah. how we we uh, one of the first things I did when I got to France was, and again, I mean, when I got to LA was, I I, I called up Lois Duan, who was the food critic of the LA Times, and I said, Lois, I'm new in town. I just graduated from France. Blah blah blah. This is what I've been doing. Who knows the most about wine? Who knows the most about food? She said, Jean Bertrand at L'Hermitage. And Dennis Overstreet at the Wine Merchant, of course, right in Beverly Hills, because that's where it was. Um, the people that had the disposable income at the time to spend on restaurants and on wine were lawyers and doctors. Uh, Hollywood wasn't quite into it, but they were a very good portion of it because they shot so many movies all over the world. You know, they were they were exposed to this stuff. Um, and it, it became a, a, a thing where I would say, okay, Jean, what do we need to do? So I, I again, I always make this statement. I said, oh, my biggest mistake was I should have founded FedEx because that's what I would do. I, they didn't have anything. So I'd call up my purveyors in France. I had a little bistro in Paris before I left. And I called up my guys and I said, do me a favor. Can you go to the market? In those days, Lial was still there. It was before it had moved to Rangis. I said, would you go and just put it in a styrofoam box, put a little ice in it, go take it to the airport and I'll pick it up the airport and I'll bring it in here. And we started bringing in all of these greens uh, you know, mosh, arugula, and in those days, roquette, um, 
uh, every everything, frise au lardon, you know, was a, one of my dishes. I couldn't find any frise in the United States. Imagine all of this. I mean, it was insane. So we're bringing in fish. We're bringing in all the fish you would have bought in, in Los Angeles in, in those days was frozen, you know, and, and none of the meat was aged. I mean, it was a real interesting time. So the second step was I met a guy named Dennis Weiss who owned Northwestern uh, Produce, and I said, look, we got to start growing this stuff here. This is pathetic. So he had a band of, of farmers that he was beginning to deal with. So we brought in all those seeds, you know, heirloom tomatoes, heirloom beets, heirloom everything, greens, everything. And we, got, we convinced a lot of people in northern Mexico, in the Imperial Valley, which is east of L.A. and San Diego, uh, in, the, in the Oxnard, in, which is one of the five great growing places in the world, uh, the, the San Fernando Valley. I used to have a salad called San Fernando Valley Greens because that's where they were grown. Uh, and we began this process. You know, people talk about farm to table. We had to create the farms. So that's how it evolved into the farmer's market, which we were very fortunate when everybody got together. I said, we're you know, right here. Right, down the block from right, me. Right down the block, one block away. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's it's just fantastic. It's still today, almost 36 years later, uh, the, one of the best farmer's markets in the country. Yeah, it's it's exceptional. And anyone who should visit should take a walk through and just see the yeah. incredible things that, that oh hit the stalls every single day. Oh, and my East Coast chefs come out and they just, they, they sob. Yeah, it's it's pretty unfair. <laughs> it's 12 months a year. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty unfair. We're talking 12 months yeah, a year. Yeah, you can, there's a strawberry there year round that'll bring you to tears. Yeah. So Harry's berries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you, when you open Jams, I mean, sorry, when you open Michael's um, and you had this incredible staff yeah. and you've got the location and you have the ingredients coming over and things seem to be coming together. Right. You're still very young. You right. have some great background. Yeah. Is there, are, are you fearful of engaging in this large project in California? What are your, what are your fears at that point? And also did you have someone that you could lean on for that logistical Expertise. I know you had said that you had you had watched in in, in yeah. Chicago, but yeah. but you know you're talking about opening up a a, a very busy California restaurant right. and you're doing everything. Right? Was there someone else that was? Did you have a GM that you were leaning on, or not really? Not really. No, it was. Uh, I had a very simple vision, and I wanted to keep it simple, and uh, it was going to be the experience, which meant. The restaurant is half outdoors and half indoors. It was gonna. My wife, uh, who I met in Boulder in 1975, um, uh, was a painter. So we were very involved in the art world. Uh, fortunately, the the owners of um, of uh, Gemini G E L uh, lived five minutes from the restaurant. So any artist that came out to do prints at uh, Gemini, you know, all the New York artists, all the English artists, whether it was. Hockney or, or Rosenquist or it was Jasper Johns or Lichtenstein, et cetera. They all came to the restaurant. And we learned the, the, the Peter Goulds from L.A. Louvre was a very instrumental help to me about getting in the local artist. You know, Venice and Santa Monica has a really cool history from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, even today. Now it's Silicon Beach. But in those days, it was Art Central. Um, and, you know, no, I, I didn't really. I had a really good group. I assembled a team. And, um, you know, I learned from Hollywood in that sense. You know, I wanted to be the producer, the director, you know, and, and, and just get this thing going. Um, and literally in September of 79 is when I found the New York location. And I knew immediately I wanted to go back to New York and open a restaurant there. And I found it. It had the garden. It has a beautiful garden there. And I said, you know, I really want to do this. And, and, and it took me 10 years. to. I waited for that address because of that garden room. But I knew that that was going to be what it was going to be. Can you speak on building a team and also gauging talent as you moved to a second location and you were splitting your time in between New York and California? What do you look for still to this day in people that you uh, work with, that you bring into your restaurants? How do you how do you tap them and, and how do you inspire them to continue to grow? Well, I think, again, having, having uh, spent the, the, about the first five or six years of Michael's at Santa Monica, we trained everybody on everything because there were no other real, there were no cooking schools really at the time, and, and there were no other chefs. There was Wolfgang Puck. 
there were a few of the French kitchens, but there were really no Americans in the business so that you would learn, you know, you would get people that had a track record. Well, that began to change, obviously, in the, in the mid-'80s. Um, and, uh, you know, that's when sort of the food revolution really kicked in. That's when Italian food went regional, French food went regional, uh, you know, uh, Latino food, our Mexican food, the Guatemalans, everybody, it just started to, everything started to sort of, you know, go, like just what happened in Brooklyn after, you know, the 2008, you know, debacle is when this, there was a, a, as I say, a good recession works in a really good way and that it forces creativity without spending a lot of money because that's what happens. You know, you don't need to build the Vegas $10 million restaurant. You don't need to build the big shot $5 million space. You can just rent a hub in a little area, which is really neat, and, and, and do exactly what we did. You provide great service, great food, good vibe, and you'll be contemporary to the point where you're understanding what your clients are about. But you're also, you know, you're also pushing the envelope. I want to talk now about the change at Michael Santa Monica that perhaps to some of your longest tenured guests may have pushed the envelope. Miles Thompson is your new chef there. Yes. Uh, many people in LA experienced his food via pop ups, yeah. and uh, he worked at some places that are uh, very casual and, and quite progressive in the exciting things that they've done with meat. He worked at Animal and Son of a Gun right. with uh, Vinny and John, who have some wonderful places. True, did you did you hire Miles without eating his food? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, that yeah. seems that seems exceptionally weird to me, to be yeah. perfectly honest, I, that you would have done that. Can I, you speak about that? Well, I think I think that it 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 was again, you know, it's like about now I would be a year and a half ago, my longtime chef uh, had another baby and decided to leave town. So my son, who I'd attempted to dissuade from being in the restaurant business for 26 of his 28 years, uh, said, okay, dad, let's do this. I said, what? No, you know, you stay writing and do your guitar and music. And, you know, he's, he's been published and all that other stuff. I, no, 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 no. We got a shot here. And I said, all right. So it was sort of like the dirty dozen, you know, <laughs> except for I'm all dozen. They bring me out and we say, okay, how are we going to do this? So, you know, I sent out, my son and I sent out emails to 42 chefs. We assembled a list, like the John and the Vinnies and the Old Guard and the New Guard and in New York, et cetera. And I said, you all know what Michael's Restaurant is. This is a fantastic opportunity for the right person. Uh, send them on. And within 15 minutes, uh, Zach Pollock from Alimento uh, sent an email. If you could find Miles Thompson, he's your guy. And then Kevin uh, Meehan from Cali. If you could find Miles Thompson, he's your guy. So I, already I had the vibe. So I said to Chess, find Miles Thompson. And he tracked him down, and he was in the Caribbean. He was in St. Kitts. And um, I, I had gone online, and I'd researched uh, his, his uh, you know, three years at Nobu, uh, John and Vinny's uh, place, you know, Animal and Son of a Gun, and then the restaurant that he sort of shined in his own food, which was called Alumet in Echo Park in 2011. You know, and again, uh, as they say, it was a critically acclaimed restaurant. Echo Park wasn't quite the financial base that it is today, six, seven years later. Uh, but it was, again, the beginning of Instagram. There was a lot of pictures. There was a lot of menus still, and the praise was extraordinary. So Chaz found Miles, and I, I, we said, well, where are you, Miles? He says, I'm in L.A. I said, what? I thought you were in St. Kitts. Well, I just happened to be here. I said, well, what are you doing tomorrow? He said, nothing. I said, let's go to the farmer's market. So we met at 730 in front of Michael's, walked a quarter block down. And I immediately, you know, I fell to the back, and I watched Chaz, my son, and Miles just engage like 27-year-olds would and just continue to talk, 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 talk. And as we hit the market, the market is, I, we would go to the left, and I was just going to say, Miles, let me introduce you to someone. He already knew them all. Every farmer that saw him came out from behind and gave him a huge hug. So good. Where have you been? How fantastic to see you again. All the hipster chefs, you know, that barely acknowledge me, you know, they go, Miles, love this. What are you doing? And, and, and so I went back after that, and I said, okay, Miles, you're the guy. I can tell. You know, the vibe's correct. You, I've seen your work, in, albeit in photographs, and I've read how you've composed your menus. You know, I've been in this business so long that I can tell. And, and I, we were 100% right on. So from, from my perception of, of the current menu and also 
in comparison to what I've seen o- over the past, you know, 25 plus years at Michael's, Miles is seem to be having quite a bit of fun reinventing the menu and, and doing some things that are pushing Michael's in a, in a new direction. For example, there's a uni crab chow on mushi. Uh, currently there's a hamachi collar dish with baba ganoush on the menu. Yes. I would not consider these easily accessible classics. Yeah. Uh, they're aggressive. They're exciting. Right. There's combinations that maybe people that have been coming to Michael's for 37 years aren't used to. So yeah. two questions. Did you personally have apprehension when Miles moved in this direction with the menu? And uh, how have you dealt with any guests that have maybe said, this is not the Michael's that I remember? Right. right. Well, again, fortunately, we were at a point where another young Hollywood was coming on board another young generation of so-called 24 to 34 year olds were coming on board and they'd already been coming to the restaurant. Um, we had already gone about four years late earlier to a small plates format, a much more casual format. Uh, we renovated the place. We got rid of the white tablecloths and the fancy crystal and the, uh, Christoffel silver and the, this and the, that. And, and, and we, we just, tricked it out so that it was a beautiful, very modern, contemporary, homey, always, again, the same principles that it always was, more like you're going to somebody's house to eat. So we'd already made a lot of that changeover, which was fortunate. And and again, uh, uh, coming out of the 2008 recession, uh, so-called coming out, uh, we had a whole new group of people. And uh, the the prior generation had begun to eat this way as well. Fitness was a big deal. There was no fitness in 1979. The weird people were joggers. What are they doing over there? You know what I'm saying? I mean, there was no yoga mats. There was no Pilates. There was no none of that stuff. So, you know, it was a a fortunate timing that I was, again, and very lucky that I would walk into this where we had an extremely appreciative. Did we have a few people that said, oh, I can't deal with this? You know, yeah, share plates was that for a lot of people. Well, I want my first course and I want my main course. I said, well, you can do that. But again... We, we got through that very quickly, and uh, we're now embraced, you know, by all generations. And again, we're a very local Santa Monica restaurant because, you know, Uber's fine and dandy if you're hammered, but it doesn't eliminate traffic, you know what I'm saying? So we're still a, a local place, and fortunately, Pacific Palisades, Brentwood, Santa Monica, Venice... Even Malibu uh, is a, a fantastic uh, uh, pool of people that love to eat and go out. As you come up on a a major anniversary in the next couple of years at Michael's, is there any way to kind of articulate the secret sauce of how you've been able to keep it going and keep both restaurants open and relevant and you seem to be having a hell of a lot of fun doing it. Yes. Well, that's the number one thing. When it becomes work, it's not worth it. Uh, you asked earlier about Miles' menu. Is it, uh, how is it being received? Said, that's, again, an example of the reason. We constantly evolved the restaurant. Uh, my biggest motto is change is good, but I, it needs to be evolution, not mutation. In other words, if you're going to make a change or you're going to improve something, it must be better than what was there before. And that has a lot to do with the times and what's going on out here. And competition's a very big deal. I mean, my God, the amount of restaurants. When I said when I opened in 79, there were a half a dozen restaurants of note. Uh, One of the reasons our restaurant was so successful in New York right off the bat was for 10 years, everybody from New York ate my restaurant whenever they were in L.A. And so I kept saying, yeah, we'll be there next year, next year, next year. Ten years later, we opened up and ba-boom. But it was a very different uh, uh, time. And, and now there's 20 great restaurants in every single neighborhood, everywhere. You know, and That's before you get to Portland and Seattle and San Francisco and the Mission District and Chicago and Minneapolis and Detroit. Look at Detroit. I leave you with this last question. If a young chef and restaurateur who is about to open their restaurant comes yep. to you and they want one piece of advice, what piece of advice do you give them? Uh, I think the, uh, it's funny, but location, location, location is a cliche, but it is really, really still the most solid part. That said, your concept must be relevant. Um, 
I don't know if you know the Smile guys, you know, Carlos and Matt. Those guys are fantastic, and, and I've watched them grow. They're friends of my daughter, and, and I've watched them grow in the restaurant business uh, to be extremely successful. And um, I, I think they minded the correct things. They found great concepts for the location that they were going to find, great location, found the concept that should work there, but it was true to their form. They weren't trying to do something that shouldn't be done there. They weren't putting the proverbial square peg through the round hole. They weren't doing that. You know, they thought about it enough. Uh, and I think that that's the case everywhere. You know, like we talked about Detroit. I mean, you know, every area um, has people that are finding out what's supposed to go there. What's natural? You know, it goes back to the food. What's supposed to grow here? It's like in California when they started growing wine, California wine. They all tried to duplicate Bordeaux. And you can't duplicate Bordeaux. So you had, it took them a long time to make wine that was supposed to come from California. And uh, now look at the wine-growing regions. They're phenomenal. We have a little winery in Malibu, a vineyard. We make 200 cases of Pinot Noir right above Carbon Beach. <laughs> it's a riot. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for being here and sharing some of your career and sharing some of your stories. It's been a pleasure. Congratulations on so many years being open. Just to let everybody know, where are the two Michaels located? Where can they find your restaurants? Uh, Michaels Santa Monica is at 1147 3rd Street. We're just north of the promenade, the 3rd Street promenade. Uh, and, the, and the farmer's market is on, on, on Arizona and 3rd, 2nd in that area, one block away. Michael's New York is on 55th and 5th Avenue, 24 West 55th, down the street from the peninsula. Um, and uh, that's open breakfast, lunch for dinner. In L.A., I can't get them out of bed. They're too busy doing their yoga in the morning. Just dinner in L.A. Great. Thanks so much. Everyone, thank you for listening. Join us every Tuesday for a new episode of The Line here on Heritage Radio. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Are you hungry? Well, you're in luck. Meet and Three is back for season 16. I'm Taylor Early, and we've got a whole new batch of reporters I am so excited to introduce you to. Hi, Hi there. I'm Elizabeth Fisher. Asha McElroy. Sam Girardi. Jessica Gingrich. Hannah from Wisconsin. I'm a swing dancing audio engineer. I am a future registered dietitian nutritionist. I'm from New York and I love rice and beans. My favorite food of all time is a shrimp burrito. I love watermelon. We've also got a bonus podcast for you called Behind the Internship. Three of our reporters will take you along to show how they develop stories for this very show, Meet and Three. Hi, I'm Danielle Flitter, a plant-based chef from Philadelphia, living in Mexico City. I'm Sophia Hooper. I'm a bartender based in Portland, Maine. My name is Addison Austin Liu. I am a chef and food journalist from Salt Lake City, Utah, and my favorite food is Peruvian. Rice and beans. Hand-drawn noodle soup. So tune in to enjoy a square meal for your ears. And I hope you saved a little room for dessert.